For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. When people talk about the greatest teams in NFL history to not win the Super Bowl, there's one team that is on everyone's list. And that is this team right here, the 1969 Minnesota Vikings. After being fairly mediocre or quite bad for much of the 1960s, they were finally starting to turn the corner under Bud Grant in 1968, when they made it to the playoffs for the first time ever. And then, when 1969 came around, they exploded and were one of the greatest teams that football fans had ever seen. When all was said and done, the Vikings ended that 1969 season with a 12-2 record, losing in Week 1 to the New York Giants and in the final week to the Atlanta Falcons in a meaningless game, and winning every single game in between those bookends. They had the number one offense in football, scoring 379 points across 14 games, for an average of over 27 points per game. They had the number one defense in football, allowing just 133 points, or 9.5 points per game. No other team was even in the same stratosphere as them defensively. They had a point differential of plus 246, meaning that, on average, they were outscoring their opponents by more than 17 points per game. This was 100 points better than the next best team. And not only did the Vikings have 9 Pro Bowlers, but their defensive line with Carl Eller, Gary Larson, Alan Page, and Jim Marshall was so good that literally every single starting defensive lineman made the Pro Bowl that season. People debate whether the 1969 Vikings or the 1998 Vikings were the better team, and which team truly was the best in Vikings history. But regardless of which way you lean, it was clear. The 1969 Vikings were an unbelievable team that truly exemplified the 40 for 60 mantra of 40 men competing for 60 minutes. And if you need yet another example of how good the Vikings were in 1969, and just how dominant they were, they were so good that they were able to win a game without practicing. Seriously. Practice is an important part of the preparation that you might have for a given week. It allows you to go over the plays. It allows you to look at things your opponent might do and certain looks they might run. It allows you to stay in game shape, and it keeps you in a routine. And the Vikings were so good that during one particular week of the season, they were able to not just win, but absolutely dominate their opponent without holding a single practice. This wasn't one of Bud Grant's philosophies, and this wasn't one of those things where the Vikings had a bad week of practice. No, this was quite literally a week without practice. Because this is the story behind what might just be, considering the circumstances, the craziest moment of the season for the 1969 Minnesota Vikings. Before I talk about the reasons why the Vikings couldn't hold practice and couldn't prepare the way that they wanted to, we need some context to understand the importance of the game at hand. It's November 23rd, 1969. It's week 10 of the NFL season, and as we're heading down the home stretch and into the final month of the regular season, we've got a battle on our hands at Metropolitan Stadium between the Minnesota Vikings and the Pittsburgh Steelers. This was a pretty important game for Minnesota, seeing as back in 1969, you had to win your division to make the playoffs. Second place was not good enough. The good news for the Vikings was that they were in first place in the Central with an 8-1 record. But the bad news was that the Detroit Lions at 6-3 were right on their tail, and the Vikings had to play the Lions on Thanksgiving just four days later. Win this game, and you give yourself some margin for error heading into Thanksgiving. Lose this game, however, and you're in grave danger of losing that division lead and missing the playoffs. But on paper, this game should be an absolute cakewalk and shouldn't be a problem whatsoever. I mean, they're playing this team right here, the Pittsburgh Steelers, as in, the worst team in football. Through the first nine weeks of the season, Pittsburgh was dead last in the league with a 1-8 record, and they had absolutely nothing to play for. They had a point differential of minus 101, which was the worst in the NFL. They had the third worst offense in football by this point, and the second worst defense in football, only better than the New Orleans Saints. The Steelers were the inverse Vikings, 
They won their first game of the season, defeating the Detroit Lions 16-13. And now, they enter this game on an 8-game losing streak, having been held to 7 points or less in each of their last 2 games, in 3 of the last 4, and in 4 of their last 6. And when you consider the fact that through 9 weeks, the Steelers had turned the ball over a whopping 35 times, or just about 4 times per game, it's not hard to see why they were absolutely garbage. In fact, the Vikings were expected, unsurprisingly, to destroy this team right here, because this felt like one of the biggest mismatches in NFL history on paper. The Vikings were 19-point favorites, which for some perspective, was a bigger point spread than Super Bowl III between the New York Jets and the Baltimore Colts. At least according to Vegas, if the Steelers somehow won this game, it would have been a bigger upset than that game that took place 11 months before. So we needed something to level the field and make things a little bit more interesting. Leave it to the Minnesota weather to come through and deliver the goods. Because the weather in Minnesota around this time was predictably brutal. In the week leading up to the game, Metropolitan Stadium, as in this venue right here, was hit with one and a half inches of snow. In fact, parts of Minnesota were hit with six inches of snow, and it would have been more if it wasn't for the fact that the temperatures fluctuated enough to the point where there was freezing rain. So you would think that with this weather, that the Vikings would practice indoors. However, the Vikings did not have an indoor practice facility in 1969. They held all of their practices at Metropolitan Stadium, as in, the venue where they played their games. You might be saying to yourself that this shouldn't be a problem. You practice in the elements since you play in the elements, and if it's snowing, you practice in the snow. And if you know Bud Grant, you know that the cold weather is just a mindset, and it shouldn't be an issue whatsoever. And to be fair, the Vikings were fully intent on doing that. Oh, they were absolutely going to do that, just as they had done many times before. There was just one small problem with this plan of theirs. Remember how I said that there was snow and freezing rain and it fluctuated between the two? Well, the stadium tarp didn't take too kindly to that. Metropolitan Stadium had a tarp put over its playing surface in order to protect it, as many stadiums do across all sports in anticipation for cold weather or bad weather. You don't want the field to get destroyed by rain or snow and become a giant mud pit. So you put a tarp over it so that the tarp can take the beating. Well, putting the tarp on the field was fine. Getting the tarp off the field? That was another issue entirely. Because due to the freezing rain and snow, when the Vikings arrived to practice on Tuesday, November 18th in preparation for their game against the Steelers, the tarp was frozen on the field and could not be removed. Said head coach Bud Grant on the problem, they've been sweeping the snow off the field and it should be completed within a day or so. But as soon as the snow is removed, the ground freezes solid. Put that together with a 30 mile an hour wind and 18 degree temperatures, and you hardly have conditions conducive to a good practice. Because of this fluctuation, what would happen was that the snow would cover up the tarp. The snow would be removed from the tarp and be shoveled off to the side, thereby taking up valuable real estate on the sideline. So the Vikings can't really do a whole lot there. Then, when the snow is off the tarp and the tarp can be removed, it's frozen to the ground due to the freezing rain and the low temperatures. Then, more snow piles up and the process is repeated, making this a lost cause. And despite the Vikings trying everything in their power to get this tarp removed for the game, including getting fans to blow hot air underneath the tarp to thaw it out, it was no use. You might be saying, wait a second, why don't they just get an insulated pad? Well, the Vikings didn't think about that. They only realized that this might be a good idea after the Steeler game, when they immediately purchased a pad to cover the field to prevent something like this from happening again, especially because they had a home game on December 14th against the San Francisco 49ers. You wonder why they wouldn't have thought of this before, seeing as Minnesota is always cold around this time of year, and this is always a possibility. It's not as though snow was a newfound thing, and it's not as though this was a team based in Phoenix or somewhere in the desert. But it was a bit too late for that now, 
because right now, the Vikings set a tarp frozen on their stadium field that made it, quite literally, impossible to practice, since they had no other facility, and you can't practice on a tarp. This meant that for the entire week, leading up to this game right here against the Steelers, the Vikings could not practice. Said General Manager Jim Thinks, We're concerned. This poses a hardship. Sooner or later, no practice catches up with you. And it's not as though the Vikings could have practiced elsewhere. Yes, in the immediate aftermath of this, they signed a contract allowing them to practice at a field house on the campus of the University of Minnesota when the weather was bad. But that contract didn't take effect until the following week. Since the Vikings never thought about this before, this was a last minute contract, and seeing as the college team needed the field house, since they were still in season. So when the best team in football was playing the worst team in football on that Sunday in Minnesota, for all intents and purposes, the best team was being handicapped by not having the ability to practice, because they had no backup facility, and their current facility was covered by a tarp that they could not move. Which is why it's incredible, all things considered, that the game turned out the way that it did. Call it just the Vikings being that good, or call it just the Steelers being that bad, or call it a combination of both. Call it what you want. However, when all was said and done, this game was not even close, as the Minnesota Vikings, despite not practicing all week, ended up winning this game by a final score of 52-14, more than covering that already insanely high 19-point spread. Minnesota had the lead from wire to wire, and score the final 35 points of the contest in the second half to put the game beyond any doubt. It was another dominant day for Minnesota's defense, which forced five turnovers, held the Steelers to just 10 first downs, held the Steelers to 48 rushing yards on 25 carries, or less than two yards a carry, and forced starting quarterback Dick Shiner to leave the game after getting injured, but not before he threw two interceptions and posted a passer rating of 30.8 which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. It was a dominant day at the office for the Vikings, who maintained their two-game lead on the Central, and got the much-needed win to give themselves some breathing room atop the Central. As for what happened after the game between these two teams behind me right here, the Minnesota Vikings would continue their domination and would finish the regular season with a 12-2 record, and would make it to Super Bowl four making it to their first Super Bowl in franchise history before falling at the hands of the Kansas City Chiefs in a massive upset in what was the final game ever between the National Football League and the American Football League. As for the Pittsburgh Steelers, this blowout was a pretty good capsule of how that entire 1969 season went for them. They ended the season 1-13, they finished with the worst record in football, and they were just putrid all the way around. But there obviously were better days ahead. And any Steeler fan that had hard feelings toward this scheme, I'm sure those feelings went away a few years later when these teams met at Super Bowl IX and the Steelers got the last laugh. The Steelers had nothing but praise for the Vikings afterwards and knew that they were an amazing team. Steelers head coach Chuck Knoll said that the Vikings were a better football team in every way and that they had a belief in themselves, pride, extra effort, and momentum. Steelers wide receiver Roy Jefferson praised the defensive line of the Vikings, saying that their line made everyone better because of how good they were. And Steelers quarterback Dick Shiner said, quite bluntly, their pass rush is great. There's no other word for it. And if you want to know just how good the Vikings were in 1969, well, this game was a pretty good indication. Not just because they blew out the worst team in football, but because of all the circumstances they went through in order to do it. To be incredibly rusty, to not practice all week because of circumstances out of your control, and to do that? The Vikings were so good in 1969 that at least when it came to NFL teams, no one, not even a tarp, could hold them down. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL Trivia for cash prizes at 9pm Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, 
subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.